welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our panel, The Importance of Town and Gown in Oklahoma Communities. We're really excited to hear from a uh, community partner and also from uh, faculty and staff from across the state who work with communities as a part of their um, institutional work. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the panel and welcome and uh, say we appreciate you all taking the time uh, to spend with us and to share your expertise. Uh, Ms. Haley Beer is the Community Engagement Manager of Recruitment at Reading Partners Tulsa and works with all organizational partners to support volunteer initiatives. She's the former volunteer pro program manager at The Gathering Place, also in Tulsa, and the Education and Program Public Programs Manager at the Hardesty Arts Center. Thank you, Haley, for joining us today. Dr. Val Valerie Bluebird Jernigan is the Executive Director of the Center of Indigenous Health Research and Policy and mm -hmm. Professor of Rural Health at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. She's an Indigenous Choctaw participatory researcher trained in intervention science with the goal of combining research with action for social change. She has been the lead investigator on 10 uh, National Institutes of Health funded trials. In all her work, she's fostered long-term mutually beneficial relationships with indigenous communities that promote tribal sovereignty and build the capacity of indigenous communities to improve health. Dr. Martha Parrott is Associate Dean for the College of Science and Health Professions and Professor of Mathematics at Northeastern State University in Broken Arrow. She's the former classroom teacher who today serves pre-service and in-service teachers of mathematics through undergraduate and graduate programs. Dr. Parrott is a Da Vinci Fellow and especially prestigious teaching award in higher education. She directs the NSU Mathematics Clinic and Outreach Initiative to serve the community. And Dr. Bob Spinks is Professor of Sociology and Justice Studies at Oklahoma City University. He's the former President and CEO for United Way of Central Oklahoma and has served as Executive Director of the Community Council of Central Oklahoma, the Regional Research and Planning Organization for the Nonprofit Community. And uh, my, my, uh, I, I probably know Bob for 30 years because he was also a Boy Scout professional with Last Frontier Council. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. Uh, just reading off all the work that you all do and the different experiences you have, um, I really look forward to learning from you today. Our moderator today is Marcia Schottenberg of Redlands Community College. She's the professor of liberal studies. She earned an associate's degree in communications from Oklahoma City Community College, a bachelor's arts degree in journalism from the University of Central Oklahoma, and a master's of art degree in English and creative writing from the University of Central Oklahoma. After working as a journalist for more than 20 years, she began her teaching career at Redlands in 2009, joining the faculty full-time in 2014 and beginning the college service learning program in 2015. She now serves as department head and professor of liberal arts, as well as directing the service learning program at Redlands. Thank you so much, Marcia, for, for leading us in this discussion. Um, and I look forward to learning from all of you. Thank you so much, Joy. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, wonderful. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it's been an amazing day so far, and we've heard so many wonderful stories about how we're helping our students to become more engaged in, the, in our communities, and this panel is no different. Um, all of our panelists have done amazing work, uh, whether it be in the communities themselves and, and becoming partners with higher ed or uh, vice versa. Um, so I think what we'd like to do first is have each panelist kind of give a brief synopsis of their work. Um, and so I think that I will begin uh, with Dr. Parrott. Uh, if you will go ahead and share your, your work and, and your thoughts on this, and then we will kind of go down the line. Thank you for the invitation to be here. There's so many conversations happening these days about the importance of self-care and one awesome suggestion that I'm learning about is being sure to book end your day with gratitude. And so with that, I very much appreciate being invited to be a part of this conversation today. And like was said with the introductory welcome marks, remarks this morning, um, I do look forward to learning from each of you. 
in the uh, national evidence indicates that when it comes to the K-12 teaching and learning culture that there is a great concern about attrition and losing our great teachers soon after they have entered the profession. We also know nationally that there's a concern to support more and better mathematics for all. And because of those two great needs that can come together and be served in the same experience, uh, at Northeastern State University, we have developed a 10 year long experience now, the NSU Mathematics Clinic. And the purpose of the clinic is to first and foremost, provide a structured experience that is deeply rooted in service learning so that our teacher candidates can leave their teacher preparation experience, not only having been engaged in a rich service learning experience as a learner, but be equipped to go out and uh, create and implement service learning opportunities with their students. So the NSU Math Clinic, again, is deeply rooted in surface learning. We follow the PARC model that's written about by Rahima Wave, uh, P standing for preparation, A for action, R for reflection, and C for celebration. And that celebration piece is such an important part of bringing the whole experience full circle. And what we're noticing is that many service learning programs seem to um, fall short of actually implementing that final phase where you bring together the community partner and the student to celebrate together what they've learned through service. So this opportunity, again, is very connected to the idea of reciprocity, that there must be mutual benefits to both the NSU teacher candidate and to our community and first and foremost that academic objectives drive the service. A really quick summary of what we do. Every Tuesday afternoon, we open our clinic to K-12 families from the community. We involve our early childhood, elementary, middle school, special education, and high school teacher candidates in an experience that offers authentic teaching opportunities, which is really one of the keys here to the success of the experience and to the outcomes that we're able uh, to, to experience over time. Um, we want our community to know that this is so much more than a homework help session. Um, these teacher candidates are exposed to best practice for teaching and learning mathematics. They are trained to administer and analyze uh, nationally recognized mathematics assessment probes, which they then use to make data-driven decisions and um, design individualized lessons, instruction, and assessment that drives our teaching semester. So until this semester, our students from our, our, our community at large, which are public school students, private schools, homeschool, Epic Charter School, and the list goes on. We, we get to serve a very diverse group of, of uh, K-12 students. Um, what we know is that there are just uh, wonderful benefits to our teacher candidates. They talk about how this is probably one of the richest experiences they've had in their teacher preparation program. They have opportunities to talk and, and work with parents and have conferences with parents, which is a unique opportunity not necessarily experienced through their other courses. Um, we know that our teacher candidate efficacy grows when their efficacy grows. We know that they are more likely to stay in the profession once they've entered it. So that's a real win. And we also get wonderful feedback from our community partners, from the parents and the students we serve that uh, student, the K-12 student dispositions, their mindset towards learning mathematics is growing they are experiencing academic gains as well. And so we're just very pleased to um, have this opportunity to engage with our community. We don't advertise because the demand is so much, I guess the supply, well, there's so much more need than we are actually able to serve. And uh, word of mouth is how our experience continues to grow. Thank you for letting us tell our story. And uh, I might just finally conclude by saying that 
COVID has presented some interesting challenges and we have chosen to be intentional about seeing it as an opportunity. And as an opportunity, rather than a barrier, we have spent our semester revamping what we do from a teaching and learning perspective. And to that point, we have invested time in coaching our math clinic teacher uh, candidates how to teach math in a virtual environment, how to use digital manipulatives now that they can't just go into our resource room and pick those materials up themselves. And so I think the teachers this semester are leaving feeling even more prepared for the realities of the profession than in previous semesters because they do now feel that whatever their classroom looks like when they get out into their own uh, building, their own school district, whatever they're asked to do, teach in person, teach blended, teach face to face, they at least have a framework for building on that. So uh, we're excited about the work that these teacher candidates are doing and the wonderful outcomes our community partners are experiencing. So thank you for letting us tell our story. Thank you so much, Dr. Parrott. Uh, Dr. Bluebird Jernigan, would you please share your experiences with us? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for organizing this excellent symposium. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak today. I am a community-based participatory researcher. And I've been doing that for about 20 years now. I've been working in the field of community engaged research with native communities. The work that I do is based on a, we call it community-based participatory research or CBPR approach. And so as a researcher, I was trained in a traditional research um, kind of orientation. And so I learned how to do traditional epidemiological research, but what I felt was really missing from that, especially when it comes to health disparities and working with communities that are marginalized with high rates of um, you know, negative health outcomes is that the community voices were not heard at the table with the researchers. And so I, went to UC Berkeley and started studying that issue and got trained in CBPR. And so that sort of approach turns traditional research on its head. And the work that we do really involves the community at every single level of the research process from identifying the research question of interest to collecting the data and determining, you know, how we're going to do that, what surveys will we ask, what types of questions will go on the surveys, uh, we do interviews, what other types of data should we be collecting, to interpreting the data um, and disseminating the findings and determining the ways that we want to tell our own stories and so I, I often use the term we, but I play, play the role of both a researcher and then I'm also a community member as a Choctaw citizen. So I, I often use the term we because we, we do engage in a, a true partnership. We embrace the values of co-learning, equity. Um, everyone has shared power and ownership of the process. So the number of studies we've had in Oklahoma um, have been pretty, pretty large. Um, we worked with Choctaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation. We have a couple studies right now with the Osage Nation. We've worked with urban American Indian communities nationally and locally here in Tulsa. And we just do a lot of community-based research where the community members are themselves citizen scientists. So they actually um, you know, are out there collecting data and are part of our, our research team. Um, we have farm to um, school interventions. We've got a food pharmacy intervention. We did healthy makeovers in tribal stores. So the focus of our work tends to usually be in food system interventions to pr uh, promote healthy eating and um, reduce cardiometabolic disorders. 
And so that's really the type of work we do. It's, it's hugely involved um, with community and engaged and students who work with us um, get the opportunity for intensive hands-on experience at all levels, including publications. Um, we like to make sure that students um, get the experience of presenting at scientific conferences, presenting at community town halls. Um, so that's pretty much the focus of our work. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Spinks, could you please address your work? Yes, thank you, Marcia. And let me say what others have said already and how much I appreciate being a part of this group. Um, I, I'm kind of a, a, a hybrid, I guess, um, in that I uh, finished my higher ed degree work back in the uh, back in 1980 and decided after that to go into uh, working on the community side, a uh, passion that came to me from my childhood. My mother was a social worker. Uh, and as a child, I would go with her, uh, particularly on Fridays when she did her field work. So it made a real impression on me. Um, as Joy mentioned, I chose to start with the Boy Scouts because I had had a childhood, great childhood experience there. And I did work for, for the Boy Scout program for 16 years as a professional. Uh, and then I, I left that group to become the director of the Community Council of Central Oklahoma, which was a, a community planning council. We used to have pl uh, planning councils all over the country. Uh, unfortunately, they've started to dwindle away. Tulsa still has an excellent one in the Community Planning Council, and I work with those folks a lot during those years. Together, we put the 211 system in place uh, in Oklahoma and uh, did a bunch of other collaboratives. Uh, Valerie, we worked on creating the Central Oklahoma Turning Point, which was a real adventure, uh, to say the least, uh, to try to improve uh, citizen health. Uh, and then in uh, 2001, I became the president and CEO of United Way, which I did for 10 years. And uh, I was hired for that job because they wanted me to take United Way into the community. So I used the things I'd learned already to do a lot of that. And we did a number of collaboratives during that time. Uh, learned a lot about uh, collaboratives, the ones that are successful and the ones that are not. And I'm sure we've all had experience with both. Um, and then uh, in, at the end of 2010, I left United Way, moved across the street to Oklahoma City University. Uh, and as Joy said, I'm, I'm a professor there, but my real purpose at OCU uh, is I direct a program that I helped create 10 years ago to train nonprofit professionals. We have a graduate program in nonprofit leadership. Uh, we have right uh, very shortly, we'll have 150 of those individuals all over the world doing work in nonprofits, running agencies, uh, rising into uh, more responsible roles and agencies and all of that. And very much what we work with them on is the very same thing we're talking about today. How do you create good collaboratives that work? Um, one of the things I did though at OCU at the behest of my Dean was to connect our departments uh, in the Petrie College of Arts and Sciences with uh, a number of community agencies. And I kind of fell back on my United Way connections with uh, about 65 partner agencies. Uh, and so we, we've been linking those constantly for internships, for other kinds of experiences. Uh, OCU requires service learning as part of our uh, graduation requirements. Uh, we also take great pride in preparing our graduates to do community work, uh, regardless of what their field of study is. Um, so that's something I've enjoyed doing a lot um, over the last number of years. And, you know, I'll just say this and then I'll, I'll stop. I, I'm, I'm so happy that you're addressing this today because um, what I see, I guess I could say I've worked for the two most disrespected professions in the world, nonprofit leadership executive and a higher education professor. And you all know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and you know, the reality is when you start trying to link uh, the various sectors together, government, uh, for-profit, the not-for-profit, not and along with that, of course, education, you really have to educate everybody on how you work together uh, and how people view things. And so that's why I really believe what we're doing today is so valuable in, in kind of furthering that uh, sense of education among us all. 
And with that, I'll stop, Marcia. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinks. Uh, and lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Haley, is it Byram? Did I say that correct, Haley? It's Byram. Byram. See, that was my, I thought that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be very careful on that. Um, yeah. Ms. Byron, will you go ahead and, and tell us about your experience on the flip side, being one of those community partners that, that those of us in higher education are seeking out? Yes, thank you so much. Excited to be here today and share about the work that we do over at Reading Partners. As Marcia said, my name is Haley Byram, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager of Recruitment. And my main role is to work with community partners to share about the work that we do and to engage community volunteers to become involved in our program. Um, Reading Partners is actually a national education nonprofit. Um, it's been in existence for over 20 years and we have been operating in Tulsa, Oklahoma um, for eight years. And so um, one thing that we like to say is, you know, compared to other cities that we service in like New York, DC and LA, Tulsa is actually one of the smallest regions in terms of the metro area, but it's the largest in terms of the number of students that we work with and the number of volunteers uh, that we engage with. So um, this is made possible thanks to all of our partners that we have. We um, work with a lot of different education-based programs and service learning um, colleges and universities here in Tulsa. So this year we're working with over 75 service learning students, which is really great. And um, we're very excited to continue to see that number grow. Um, but what we do is we work in 28 different um, elementary sites between Tulsa Public Schools and Jinx Public Schools. And what we do is we uh, work with community volunteers to tutor students one-on-one. -on -one. And the students that we tutor are reading behind grade level proficiency. So nationwide, only 35% of students are reading um, at a proficient level by the time they enter fourth grade. So that's only about one out of every three students. And whenever I talk about that statistics, I always think, I'm one of three student or kids in my family. So that would mean only one of us would be reading at a proficient grade level. And that's really alarming. So um, we target this age group of first through fourth grade because it's the most crucial point in a learning career of when students are learning how to read. Um, and this year it's been really exciting. Um, part of the national uh, strategic plan for our organization was to develop a virtual tutoring platform. And that was accelerated because of COVID. And so in a very short amount of time, we were able to develop a virtual um, program and platform called Reading Partners Connect. So we're able to continue our traditional in-person research validated curriculum model to be delivered virtually. And so we have embarked on retraining all of our returning volunteers and then as a first step. And now we're just starting to engage with new tutors and volunteers to become involved in our program. And so with Reading Partners Connects, we're able to still serve students, whether they're doing fully distant learning or if they're doing a blended learning hybrid program or if they're um, back in school and volunteers are not allowed into the school building. So this year, our goal is to serve over 800 students and engage with over 1,000 community volunteers. That's amazing, Haley. I love that work. I love that. I need to figure out a way for, for uh, Redlands Community College to get involved in that, that project for sure. Well, moving on, um, we had a few questions for the panelists. So I'm going to pose a question and then I, I think I'll just let you all jump in and, and start the conversation how you would like it to go. Okay. Uh, so if someone could start off by telling us how you identified the community need that you address with your work and also how you set up your partnership. I think for those of us in higher ed, that's one of the, the hardest parts is how do we approach the partner? Uh, is it better to go in with, with an initial idea or without and just be open to what could happen? Um, so I will uh, open the floor to whoever would like to address that first. Well, I'm brave, I'll start. <laughs> And I'm going to use examples uh, if, with everyone's permission from the work that, that I did before I went to the university. 
uh, and, and the one I'm going to specifically mention is the one I talked about a moment ago, the creation of the Central Oklahoma Turning Point. Um, if you're not familiar, Turning Point was a national initiative that was originally funded by Robert W. Johnson Foundation and Kellogg. Uh, it was put in place in a number of different states and different uh, locations. Tulsa was one of the original locations in Oklahoma along with a couple of rural areas. I think Tahlequah might have been one of those as well. It's been too long ago for me to remember all those details, but we didn't have one in central Oklahoma. And of course, um, you know, our health statistics in Oklahoma and in particular in central Oklahoma were just absolutely abysmal. Um, and so we had worked for several years to figure out how to do this. Uh, and so the collaborative was created with, and, and I'll just tell you who the partners were, uh, we had the United Way, we had the local council of governments, the local COG, um, we had the local chamber of commerce, which is always an interesting partnership to try to develop. Um, we had the, uh, the school systems, we had the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Uh, so we had worked to put that together very carefully. Uh, now we did one thing that after kind of a little bit of a rough start, we engaged help uh, from a central Oklahoma native named David Chrysler. Uh, and some of you may know who David is. He's done a tremendous amount of work in community collaboratives, uh, even turning point initiatives. He did one in Alaska, for example. So David came back, spent a number of sessions with us. Um, we started out with 200 people from all parts of the community. Uh, and Valerie, I'll say that we were very intentional in making sure we had uh, the the uh, uh, non-traditional voices in the room, shall we say. Uh, we wanted people who were suffering from those health issues uh, to inform us as well. Uh, this group met over a period of about uh, seven months, every other week. We started out with 200, we ended up with 185, which is not too bad. Uh, we did have some flow in and some flow out because of moves and job changes and those kinds of things. But there were a couple of things we did that I, I think are pretty important on something like this. One, we made sure that when someone new came in, uh, we oriented them first on where the group was because we didn't want to allow someone new to come in and try to take us all the way back to square one. Uh, we were trying to keep things moving forward. So we had an orientation process, not to say to them that we didn't value what they had, had to bring to the table, but we wanted them to know what had already been discussed and had kind of been decided. Um, the second thing was, and this was really tough, uh, but we were very strict about this. Uh, we weren't there for someone to bring their favorite pet voice to the table or their favorite pet project to the table just so they could sell everybody on it. Uh, there were a couple of instances where we had to ask someone to leave the collaborative because of that. Uh, there was one instance where a person uh, started to do that and then realized what we were doing was really a better way to do it. So he changed his whole approach. Um, so my point in that is I think you have to have some fairly strict rules and processes in place and, and you have to follow them and you have to have a leader uh, like David was for us that's sort of the neutral voice in the room. Uh, who is devoted to the process and not simply to the topic at hand. And then the other thing we worked really, really hard on was to make sure, every, make sure everybody was commonly educated on all of the details and the information from the beginning. It was very research-based. Uh, we are part of our collaborative were uh, evaluators from the School of Public Health uh, at the university. They were also uh, from that school we had help in getting uh, research data we need, plus the, the chamber's data and so forth. So again, building a collaborative like that, we had to make sure we had all the right people at the table and they worked very hard to keep them at the table. I'll be happy to follow Bob's lead in sharing how we became aware of need. Before about a year before we developed the NSU Mathematics Clinic as a part of our institutional community engagement and service mission, we uh, developed first uh, our reading faculty developed uh, a reading clinic, a reading center program. And so I think the point I'd like to share is that the need came to us 
when families were being served in the reading clinic, they were expressing need for support in the area of mathematics across grade levels as well. And so in collaboration with reading faculty, uh, we became aware of this need and we were able to create this experience. A second uh, community engagement opportunity that I'm so humbled and privileged and proud to get to be a part of is uh, working with the Tulsa Regional STEM Alliance together supporting in the greater Tulsa area, the math mentor program. And this is where we engage corporate partners, Quick Trip, Williams, One Oak. We have volunteers from those corporations who go into schools one day a week at a routine time and they engage with students in math games that are designed to support important mathematical learning processes. And while both of these two service outreach opportunities are somewhat different, they still are united by the same common need and that is more and better mathematics for all. And so as we look out and think about what uh, students uh, in K-12 are needing in areas of support, uh, mathematics certainly always tends to emerge as, as, a, as a strong need area. And what we're finding in terms of this math mentor program where corporate partners, again, I work with corporate partners in helping coach them to um, think about and recognize uh, either negative uh, growth, negative mindset or productive growth mindset. How do we respond to students when, um, you know, a student says, I'm not smart enough to play this game. Um, that's where some of the partnerships, again, uh, provide support. What we're finding is that there are tremendous academic gains with both the uh, math clinic experience on site at our institution, and there are definitely academic gains when we're working with corporate, corporate partners going out into schools. And interestingly, we're also seeing a lot of data that suggests um, relationship building is becoming a really positive outcome and benefit of the uh, math mentor experience that you know wasn't even initially anticipated. So I think to summarize in terms of where did the need come from, how did we recognize it, it really fell into our laps. We feel blessed by that and are glad we had our eyes open to recognize when the need was there. I can say that as a researcher, I've been pretty fortunate in that I get to decide if the expertise that I have and the interests that I have align with a particular community's goals and focus in terms of what they want to want to study, want to work on. Uh, it's usually very, very, very important to assess that fit because in this kind of research, it's a long-term relationship that you build. And unless you're ready and willing to engage in that type of a relationship and avoid what we call helicopter research where you're going in, collecting data and then disappearing and nobody knows where you went or what happened to their information, um, that, that's really what we want to avoid. And so as a researcher, we have to be really honest with ourselves about whether or not we're willing to and able to engage in the partnership. And that takes some time. It takes some time to assess initially. It, it takes a lot of um, honesty and transparency in your needs and interests and what you bring to the table. And it also takes a pretty um, honest assessment of this community's capacity to engage in research. And I emphasize that because research is very different than programmatic work. Um, if a community is in need of dollars to support programming, that's a very different 
um, priority than a community that has specific research questions that they want to investigate. And so um, unless that, that's, that exists and um, those questions you know, emerge and we discuss them, it's really not a good fit. Um, the, the research grants that we get are to explore specific questions and test hypotheses. They are obviously very much focused on benefiting the community and the process itself should benefit the community. And that's our top priority, but it is within the framework of research. So those are all things that go into assessing a community fit. And most of the partnerships that I've had have lasted for at least about seven, eight longer years. And um, so, you know, we work on long-term problems and long-term systems changes. Yeah, I'll share um, just about the work at Reading Partners. So we typically reach out to faculty and staff to provide information about our program and how classes and students can become involved. Um, once we do establish a partnership with a professor, we definitely work together to identify the goals and parameters of the partnership. And creating and just maintaining that relationship with professors has been extremely instrumental um, for the success of our partnerships. And we've noticed that when we work with professors that require um, their class participation um, in our program for class credit, we definitely see a greater success in student involvement and participation. Um, the commitment to become a tutor at Reading Partners is you're signing up to have a standing meeting to tutor your student um, once a week. And so that commitment is just about an hour and you have a set day and time that you meet with the same student throughout the school year. Um, we typically work with um, classes on a semester um, basis, but we do have a lot of students that decide to stay on throughout the entire academic year, which is really great. Um, we have seen that when it's optional for students to participate, uh, we don't see a good return on our collaboration. So we work really hard to establish those parameters early on and um, share what support reading partners will provide and all of the training um, that goes into becoming a tutor as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I am just, uh, and I hope that you all who are attending today are as well, I am astounded by the diversity and the positions and, and the viewpoints that all of our panelists are sharing today. I, I'm, I'm gaining so much information as I'm, uh, as I'm listening and I'm, I'm just, I'm honored uh, to be doing this today. Um, I think I'll move on to our next question. Our next question is about, um, we've, we've talked quite a lot now about data-driven results um, and, and collecting the research and being very mindful uh, of what we're doing in this field. Um, so the, the next question is, how do you assess the outcomes of your community projects? So um, I, I think I want to begin with Martha, if I can, <laughs> because I, I'm curious to know, do you assess the outcomes of your students and, and what their reflections are on the, the project? Or are you also assessing the mathematical grades for the elementary students? Thank you. Um, we, we assess both the experience through the lens of the teacher candidate and we assess the benefit of the experience through the lens of our community partner, which would be the students and the parents. Uh, for liability purposes, we don't um, you know, record their academic grades from their school site or school district. So we use, um, uh, in, in terms of parents and their students, we, we uh, involve a lot of self-report. Uh, parents are given an opportunity to provide feedback at the end of a teaching semester. What went well? What did you really like? Do you have suggestions for what we might do differently in future semesters? And it is in those conversations and throughout that, um, you know, we, we 
come to learn that our K-12 students are having positive dispositional changes, dispositional growth when it comes to learning mathematics, that they're feeling more efficacious. And uh, we, we hear those stories being echoed from our parents. Um, and I'll talk about our teacher candidates in just a minute. I was very intrigued this morning to hear the keynote address when we talk about hope. And as our keynote speaker today uh, helped us think a little bit more mindfully and intentionally about hope, it caused me to think about um, the circumstance that we are all in, that being COVID. And what I'm really happy to contribute to this conversation that ties into assessment and I think helps me continue to um, think about how hope, you know, contributes to the conversation. You know, our, our parents are saying things to us like, you know, thank you for doing what you're doing you're doing what others have given up on. You're doing what others won't even try right now. And so that feedback tells us that even though we've had to make so many changes, revamp the way we're doing things in order to continue the service, uh, feedback from parents and that the clinic teachers are getting from students on a weekly basis, that's very powerful to us in terms of modifying, making changes, or knowing if we're doing something well that is meeting needs. In terms of our teacher candidates, my personal research focuses on um, mathematics teaching efficacy beliefs. And again, we, uh, our teacher candidates span all majors in terms of some of them will be high school teachers, some will be middle school teachers, some special education, some will be early childhood. And wow, what a what a diverse group that is to have in one semester as well. And I do a lot of differentiation in order to try to meet those needs. But um, we I encourage students at the beginning of the semester to respond to an instrument and um, their self-efficacy and outcome expectancy beliefs are scored, two different subscores, and then they're encouraged to um, participate in that instrument again at the end of the semester, and we do see some gains. I would propose that in one given semester, we're probably not going to see a lot of statistically significant gains in efficacy beliefs, um, but the thing I'd like to contribute is that because our students find this such a valuable experience, they often repeat the experience in multiple semesters. And that's where I think uh, longitudinally, I, I love how Valerie's talked so much about the importance of sustaining long-term relationships, which is what we feel like we're trying very much to continue to sustain with our community, but also with clinic teachers when, you know, they, they enroll in this experience initially because it meets a plan of study requirement, but then they stay, they return. And I think it's in those situations that we're gonna see even longer growth over time. As the instructor of record, it is their reflections where I can see that qualitative change over time, that depth, that growth, um, I'll be honest with you, when our clinic teachers began this semester, they were afraid. They're like, I don't even know how to find uh, an interactive math opportunity online. How in the world am I ever going to teach someone? But we've, we've incorporated a strong mentoring component into what we do where returning teachers are kind of reaching out to those who are new. And um, I guess to bring this full circle and conclude my remark, it is those reflections where we start hearing our math clinic teachers say, I can't believe how much I've learned and not only how much I've learned, but how excited I am about what I've learned and how prepared, much better prepared I feel like I am. I'm hearing this semester, again, uh, clinic teachers say things like, this has been the most profound experience that I have had in my entire teacher preparation uh, career. And that's something that's really exciting to hold on to. So in answer to your question, Marsha, we look at um, 
you know, how, how are, are, are the clinic teachers growing, our teacher candidates? And then what is the impact? Are we doing what we aspire to do with um, our community partner? And I will just say that this is an overload for me and I keep doing it because these clinic teachers inspire me, these community families, they inspire me, just like all of you. I, I think we're, we're all very passionate about those opportunities. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, Martha. Uh, Bob, I'm gonna send it over to you because you share that dual role. You see what, what your outcomes, the, the effect that they can have on your community partners and as well as with your students. Well, yes, absolutely, Marcia. And, and Martha, I'm glad you mentioned the keynote. I, I could not be part of that this morning because of a prior commitment. But, you know, if you think about what community groups, and I remember I'm talking about, you know, from where I sit, broader partnerships that include lots of community groups, you know, our nonprofits, that's a big part of what they try to, to contribute to the quality of life is giving hope to people. Uh, you know, regardless of what their services are, they provide. So I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, you know, with regard to the outcomes, I think, uh, and Valerie, I, I totally agree with Valerie about the long term, uh, because we need good longitudinal research uh, on so many things. And it's hard to do that because of expense and, and, and just all the other factors we all know about. But I think the other thing that, that in these community things like this, you need to remember is you need to also collect uh, qualitative data as well, because those are the things that can help keep your partners engaged with you uh, for the long haul. And I'll give you an example. When we were doing that health initiative, uh, we had a whole lot of things that we wanted to accomplish and, and we were able to accomplish many of them, not all of them, but one of the first ones was we wanted to get some healthy snacks into the vending machines in the public schools. You guys know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's a lot of junk food there. So we took that one on. And as I mentioned, the chamber was, on, was in this with us. Um, and so we were able to make some good progress on there on that. The chamber, however, had to stand up to one of its members uh, who got very, very upset about the fact that by doing that, we were cutting into their profit margin. And so that was important from the chamber's point of view for us to be able to show more benefit from getting that done. And, and we were able to do that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think when we're thinking about outcomes, it, it's both those short term things, but also the long term things. The other thing that we were able to do that was made it easier for us is we had implemented outcomes measurement as a requirement for all of our United Way partner agencies uh, in advance of doing that. So they were already collecting outcomes uh, in approved ways. So it made it a whole lot easier for us to do that. Um, but then I think the other thing is, and this is where the partnership with higher ed comes into play so much, um, you, know, you know, most of the nonprofits don't have the capability of collecting uh, good data. Uh, we had some things in place in Oklahoma City because of the Community Council and then the United Way continuing that through a process called Vital Signs, which was a community indicators piece that we had been doing uh, and is still done in, in a slightly different way, but they put reports out periodically on community issues and identify things that need to be worked on. So we had that advantage in place, but in communities that don't have that, and particularly if we're working in smaller town settings, we've got to figure out ways for, for us in higher ed to help fill that gap. Thank you so much, Bob. And Valerie, I'd like to go to you next. How does your research how and, and what you find, how is that valuable to your community partner? And how have you seen it implemented? I would say that I would sort of say two things. One, um, in regards to data, and so we usually have this delicate balance where we're pleasing the funders with the kinds of outcomes that they are interested in seeing. We are making sure that the community outcomes that are prioritized are um, 
also being tracked. And many times those overlap very, very well. Sometimes they, you know, don't, but typically they do. And that's all part of the ass assessment of the fit. Um, and we're also tracking long-term sustainability outcomes. So when the funding goes away from this particular study, um, how will we be able to see that this has left long-term positive um, impact? So those are all the things and we try to build in the sustainability planning and the impact of this to sustainability at the front end and plan for it. We are intervention scientists in my research center. So everything we do is the collection of data for implementation in some kind of program or policy. So we're determining if the, the, um, the intervention itself, for example, a farm to school intervention is successful in increasing healthy food access and intake among native families. And we determine that and then we implement that long-term as policy and programming. So everything we do is in itself an intervention study. And we usually find even if the study itself is less efficacious than we've hypothesized, there is typically some, or some, there are some elements of it that are positive and worth sustaining. And um, we, we make sure to plan the intervention as such because um, we don't collect data just for the sake of collecting data, um, knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Um, so that's where you see the, the research turned into action for social change. And they, they all have to be in place for us to do this. Um, I don't think anyone in our lab would be interested in getting involved in a study that didn't have some obvious um, positive impact in native communities. And certainly the communities wouldn't be um, very interested in it. And they shouldn't be. Um, you know, research has been used to exploit Native communities. It's done a lot of damage. And so the kinds of research that we do are really also intended to be capacity building, empowering, and um, really reconnecting um, some, so many of the things that were exploited. And so that's, that's really a focus for all of our work. We have to make sure that it follows those values. Thank you so much. And Haley, I'm very interested on your end, what information is valuable to a, a community partner like Reading Partners? What information do you seek from your faculty members who are your partners? Yeah, definitely. So um, it's also twofold for us. Um, we, in terms of what we look for before I kind of get into what faculty looks for is we are evaluating the tutor experience. So we do tutor surveys um, two months after a tutor begins in our program to see how they're doing and just the progress that has been made. Um, we also do mid-year and end-of-the-year check-ins with all of our partners, updating them on progress. Um, that's really important for us to communicate with faculty in terms of here's what's working well, here's what's not working well, here's you know a recap of the number of sessions that your students have completed, um, which is important for them to know as part of um, issuing any academic credit. Um, we work with some teacher preparation programs, and so they're really interested to see what the feedback and experience has been like for their students in preparation for um, their candidacy. 
Um, so one of our core values at Reading Partners is data, data drives decisions. And so we spend a lot of time assessing students um, before they're enrolled in our program. We do mid-year assessments with all of our students to making sure that they're um, on track to um, gaining those reading skills to be able to read proficiently. And then we also do end of the year assessments. And it was really amazing to see that last year, um, even though we ended our programming early um, due to COVID, um, over 90% of the students that we work with were able to reach their end of the year literacy goals by mid-semester. So uh, it's just really awesome to see the work um, that's taking place thanks to all of our awesome partners and tutors that we have involved in the program. Um, we also share impact reports that include all the data with our tutor experience and student assessments with all of our partners and community stakeholders. And we just make sure that we're providing as much information um, back to our partner contacts and information sharing has been really important um, for us. Thank you so much, Haley. I, I love that, that we're all hearing today how community engagement needs to be intentional, authentic and sustainable. I think we have to have all three of those in order for it to happen and, and for it to, to continue, for that, that important work to continue. Uh, before I ask my last question of the panel, I wanna remind everyone that's on here, you can type some questions into the chat. We'll have a few minutes at the end of the session. So if you want to do that, if you have any specific questions for any of the panelists, please feel free to do so. So my last question is, where do you all see your projects and your research and your partnerships going in the next five years? So I will open the floor to whoever wants to jump on board first. I can go first this time. <laughs> Um, so we are really looking forward to working with uh, more community partners and expanding our service learning class partnerships. Um, you know, a big goal that we have is to have a sustainable pipeline um, of working with the same partners and classes each semester. So that really just helps us plan and grow year to year. So as we transition at the end of the semester, we know that there's going to be another class coming in to fill those spots um, or even adding in new tutor positions. So um, we would love to see the increase of working with service learning classes. That also leads to the increase in number of students that we work with. And just overall, we're really working towards expanding the school districts that we work in and to expand to new school sites. Well, I'll go next. <laughs> Um, and really what I want to say about this one, Marcia, is again, thinking in the broad sense, um, it's no surprise to anyone here that, uh, that COVID and a, a lot of associated things uh, the last year have made fundraising in nonprofits extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and an unfortunate byproduct of that is that many, many nonprofits uh, have been having to reduce staff uh, because of that. And what that means is when we approach them on partnerships, the most important thing they're looking at is what kind of return on investment do we have from committing our time? Um, and with time, of course, that means resources as well. So I guess my thought on that for all of us is um, whether it's something we're currently doing or something that we might wanna start, Think in terms of how you can help that nonprofit as part of the, the partnership to present to their donors something that they're doing in the community that is really significant. Because that will do two things. Number one, it will help them in raising money. But the other thing it will do is it will forward our position of being responsible partners with them in solving these community issues and these community challenges. So that would just be my thought on that. I wish I could say we could fix the health thing. That is just an ongoing huge challenge uh, that, that sadly the last year has been made even worse, uh, which we all know. Uh, that is a never ending problem. And unfortunately it's so tied to uh, personal responsibility and lifestyle. And it's very hard to get those particularly lifestyle changes. Uh, but on the health side, we're gonna continue working on it because it's, it's worth it and we need to do that. 
Uh, but anyway, that would be my thoughts at this point. Bob, I just had a quick follow up for you on that. What do you think the long term effects of the pandemic will be on nonprofits? Do you see them bouncing back after the vaccines are released or do you think it's going to be a long term? Marcia, I think this is going to be a bit of a long term. <clears throat> now, I've been through in the last 40 years, I've been through seven of these economic downturns in my nonprofit life, and all of them have been different. Uh, some shorter, some longer, some the recovery shorter, some longer. The real difference on this one is that all the sectors are so affected by this. You know, the normal donors for nonprofits are businesses and primarily individuals. And so the recovery part on this, uh, and this, this is normal, uh, it, we have to have those groups recover before then the nonprofits start to recover. Because, you know, once businesses start making better profits and individuals start bringing in more, more uh, disposable income, they're going to spend that on things that they were not able to do during the, you know, during this COVID time. Uh, so it's just going to take a little while. You know, I've seen all kinds of statistics on this. There's a lot of concern. It may take 10 years for the nonprofits to recover. I don't think it'll be that long if we can get the vaccine out there and get everybody going again, because I know how tired we all are uh, of the world we're living in right now. And I think we're looking forward to fixing that problem and moving forward. And that's where nonprofits have a really, really big role in this. So, um, but again, it's a little hard to predict. I hope it's gonna be short term. It also at the same time gives higher ed a tremendous opportunity to, to show what we can offer and create more partnerships during this time too. So we could see it as a, not necessarily a positive, but, but something that's a, an opportunity for sure. Yeah, opportunity is the good yes. word. <laughs> okay, uh, Valerie, what do you see? Where do you see your research going in the next five years? I would say two primary directions. One is increasing the number of students who can experience and and be trained in this kind of approach, especially interdisciplinary teams. Physicians, clinicians can't solve all of these health problems in their 15 minute visits with patients. And so it really is community level action that's greatly needed to create better health. So we need, we need the next generation of of students, of young people to have a broader, more interdisciplinary um, training than used to be available. And then I would also say, we'll, we'll continue to work within the food systems for quite a while, I believe. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and the ways that food systems relate to health, but our immediate um, urgent needs are to make sure that we're incorporating environmental um, measures in that because the environmental changes that we're seeing on this planet are an urgent public health crisis and it has to be considered important in all disciplines and so certainly within public health and within food system work it's an issue that we have to become more aware of and learn how to better um, manage and incorporate into our into our studies. Thank you so much. And Martha, what about your program? We need to expand. We need to keep growing what we do because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the demand is far greater than we can meet, which is why we advertise only by word of mouth um, versus um, you know, more, more direct intentional kinds of opportunities. I think expanding the program, expanding our service area, uh, there was a wonderful question in the chat box about whether we use any 
uh, online opportunities for families who can't come to the clinic? What a great question. That is the move that COVID has presented to us. We do see it as an opportunity. We are uh, being very intentional about um, grooming our teacher candidates to be able to teach virtually. And that in and of itself is going to allow us to expand our service area. Families who live more than 30 minutes away can't always get to our clinic. And so if we're going to do more virtual work, at least in the spring, then we definitely can expand our service area. But I have in mind uh, opportunities to involve graduate students and uh, partner them with undergraduate students, find some creative ways to build stronger mentoring connections and use that as a way to grow uh, the opportunities as well. So thank you for the opportunity to share that. Um, thank you guys so much for all of that. Um, Joy, do we have any other questions from the chat? I know Martha just answered that one. Oh, is uh, so one of the questions is, uh, is virtual service learning here to stay? What do you all think about that? Haley, I think I'll start with you because you had to transition as did Martha on her program. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to hear your viewpoint on that. And then Valerie, I'd like to hear your viewpoint on how COVID has impacted your research and has it made you have to take more of a virtual turn as well? Yeah, we definitely anticipate um, virtual tutoring to stay within our organization. Um, it's something that we had been preparing to launch as part of our strategic plan. And so we think that um, by having a virtual platform, we'll continue to be able to serve more students and engage with even more volunteers. Um, we know that a lot of our tutors are working professionals, and so they're unable to take the time out of their day to drive to a school site to tutor their students. So we think that um, there's a lot of advantages to um, doing the virtual tutoring for us. So we just definitely anticipate it to stay. Um, we will be continuing throughout this school year just doing virtual tutoring, and then we anticipate a hybrid model um, once it's safe to return into the classroom. I guess it will. I mean, you know, it's apparently the future. Um, <laughs> you can tell that there's a certain age cutoff, I think, of people, and I'm in the older categories. Um, this is the this is what students expect. They were going it in that direction anyway. Um, I graduated in the early 2000s and um, by the time recently I was researching different programs and it had been a long time since I, you know, researched PhD programs and I was putting together something and I needed to look and I just found every place this before COVID was offering online and hybrid models and so it's just the way the way that people expect they expect the ability to be able to do a lot virtually. Um, it does change the dynamic of community organizing, traditional community organizing. It didn't, we're fortunate that we were able to find workarounds for most of our studies. They were in places within the study where we could go to a virtual platform. One of our studies has, I think, um, suffered a little bit from the lack of one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but in general, we were able to find workable solutions. I don't think anyone's happy with the solutions, but it's satisfied the work requirements that we had to get done the goals of our study. Um, so, you know, I mean, it definitely, um, we, I did, a dissertation that was all online. So I was prepared for a, um, I, I knew how to conduct a web-based study and mail out kits to do, you know, self home tests of clinical measures. Um, 
yeah, it's part of it now. And I think it will probably most likely become part of the way that we do things in the future. And it has been going that way for a long time. Marcia? Yeah. Yeah, if you don't mind, just a couple yeah, of comments. Yes. Um, you know, I think we may be surprised when this is all over though, just how much um, our students really want to come back to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, I know we, I've had to teach online this entire semester because of health issues. Um, and our grad students have been glad to do that, but they will tell you upfront that they would much rather be in a classroom with each other, with the instructors. And of course, our nonprofit work is such a high touch business anyway, we've always maintained, we needed to try to be more in person than, than virtually. Uh, obviously there are some disciplines that will never go to virtual. OCU is a great example. It's really hard to teach dance virtually uh, and you know, our dance school is just fabulous. Uh, same with our music school. Um, they've tried all kinds of workarounds, but it's just not the same. Um, the other thing I would say though, this is kind of the other side of the coin. On our community groups, they're getting bigger turnouts for meetings, board meetings and other things virtually than they get in person. So a lot of the community groups are basically saying, well, maybe we just continue doing this virtually uh, for a while. Um, I suspect at some point that will taper off just like anything else. But so I think we've got a couple of different things running here that, that we're just going to be aware of. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, you know, we were we were excited and so surprised by the turnout for the symposium today. And we were thinking, you know, this is so great that we're being able to bring everyone together in this format when we can't meet in person, but how many of us would not be able to attend a live in-person symposium like this? So, so we're very excited about that. Uh, Bob, I do have a question for you uh, from the chat. Uh, do you teach students in your nonprofit program how to collaborate with higher ed institutions and what does that look like? We teach collaboration in the broad sense. Uh, and certainly discussing collaboration with higher ed institutions is very much a part of that. Um, you know, a lot of that conversation is, is connected to what I discussed a few minutes ago, that the first thing you need to do is sit down and learn to understand each other. Um, because, you know, people have expectations. We all know this. Uh, when we go into a collaboration, certainly from the higher ed side, we have, we have expectations. Uh, that are both institutional and professional. Uh, the same is frankly true with the nonprofits. So we try to try to work a process with them to say, Let, let's, let's get to know each other first and understand what the problem is first. It's sort of that thing I mentioned earlier about David uh, Crystal's approach on, on how, you, how you deal with a community-based issue. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very important. And we do that, Marsha, because we, we feel like you know, we, we often talk about the three sectors, business, uh, government, and nonprofits. I, I tend to think of it really as four sectors because I think higher ed is really its own sector uh, in addressing community issues, uh, and they need to be treated as an equal partner at the table. Trust me, it's taken centuries for the nonprofits to fight to get some kind of recognition from the other two. Um, so I think there's also a benefit in us working together in that regard as well. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm going to uh, pose this question to anyone who would like to answer on the panel. Um, for those partnerships that are not ongoing, they come to an end at some point, how do you gracefully disengage so that the work continues? Well, I'll, I'll throw this in. I think, uh, and someone mentioned it earlier in the conversation, I think you've got to celebrate the successes you have um, because that's very important. You, you know, even if <laughs> I went to a, to, to a meeting in DC one time on a, on a federal grant that we had been doing at community council. Um, and this was like the 10 year thing and we're up there and they have this big party the night before the conference starts and everybody's feeling happy. Uh, then they start the, the session off the next morning by telling us all that the data show no change has happened as a result of this program. I mean, that was really not a happy moment for everybody in the room. Um, 
But I think celebration is a really important part of that. But I also think you have to build that continuation into your infrastructure. You simply cannot expect it to just continue without having a way to do that. Uh, and that's gotta be part of the whole plan. And I think you're honest about bandwidth too, and you're honest about um, shifting and evolving priorities. Honesty would be how I would answer that question. I mean, you have to be very honest about, you know, we're excited to continue to support um, in a sort of less active way and, you know, doing it as early as you can in that process and then slowly making sure that you've trained other people who are there who carry on the aspects that are important. But honesty is key. Honesty and because nobody wants to find something out last. So you always want to tell people, we think we may need to shift priorities in the next year or so. And Valerie, there was a, a question directly for you. Um, you mentioned citizen scientists. Um, can you expand a little bit more on that concept? Citizen scientists is a term we occasionally use in public health. And it basically is the examples that come from environmental health would be probably the best way to illustrate it, which would be, you know, um, breakthroughs that have happened because communities were heavily involved in the data. So one of the examples that we teach is the air quality monitors that scientists would put them high up and measure the air quality, but community members came back and said, they're not getting the diesel fumes where we're breathing that are going directly into our apartment, you know, buildings and our windows and when we're walking on the sidewalks. And so having community members tell you as the outside scientists exactly how to measure things and where to best measure things and being involved and engaged and actively measuring them with you and sometimes even doing the data collection themselves. And so that's the kind of work that we, we mean when we say citizen scientists. Thank you so much, Valerie. And I think this is a, a good question to kind of end on. Um, Haley is our community partner representative here. Um, what is the biggest challenge you face with institutions so that none of us make that mistake? <laughs> with our community partners. Yeah, I would say just lack of communication. Uh, we're here to support um, our colleges and universities, our professors and our students. So when we don't know what your needs are, um, it's really hard for us to be able to work with our partners. And so um, kind of in reference to the question earlier, like we understand that programs and partners ebb and flow and that they're not always going to be a perfect fit. And so um, just maintaining that communication is is really key. And we've had to do that so many times this semester with different changes. As some of the districts that we work with go back to in person, we've had to pause tutoring so we can give district staff you know, ample time to get resituated. And so just that constant communication has been really important for the growth of um, our relationships with service learning classes. Okay. Thank you so much. Do any of our panelists have any last words of wisdom to impart? You guys are all talked out. Keep collaborating. <laughs> Very good. I, I might share this final thought, Marsha. In most conversations that are happening as a result of COVID and changes that we're making, an important question is being asked. And that important question is, what changes have you made as a result of adjusting to the climate that COVID has presented that are positive, that you want to keep in place? And I can certainly see in all of these stories today that there are perhaps some 
awesome adjustments that have been made as a result of dealing with a challenge that we can continue to use as a best practice and as an opportunity over time. So I continue to reflect on the engagement opportunities that come my way and think about how there are some good things that have happened. And I wanna make sure that I'm noticing that, reflecting on that and taking the best of the changes that have been forced upon us and making sure that we keep implementing them. I love that uh, Haley used the word hybrid a little while ago, if I'm remembering correctly, and um, just a, a blend of what we did before, but maybe some better things are happening as a result of dress, addressing challenges that can keep us all pushing forward. And to, to build on what Bob said and also what Martha said, let's keep celebrating too, right? Right. And thank you all so much for all of your help today. And all of your stories have been so powerful and, and we're so appreciative and grateful. I will let you all know that we have one final session today. It's our action planning session that will start at three o'clock. Um, so just join the Zoom link that went out on that. Uh, Dr. Hellman will be back to help us to kind of formulate how we see all of us coming together and supporting one another throughout the state of Oklahoma throughout our different roles and keeping all of this very important work going. So again, thank you all for joining us today.